وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واذكرن ما يتلى في بيوتكن من آيات الله والحكمة إن الله كان لطيفا خبيرا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls the enlightenment of the hearts for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa ajjil farj. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. When examining the Holy Quran's description and analysis of the relationship that the wives of the Holy Prophet should exhibit first and foremost before the Holy Messenger himself as well as other people in the society an important realization emerges which requires us to reflect upon at the outset that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal any such verses when it came to the marriage of the Holy Prophet with Sayyida Khadija صلوات الله وسلامه عليها. صلى الله عليه وسلم. The idea that if you think about it, سيدة خديجة peace be upon her was married to the Holy Prophet for approximately twenty five years. In the idea that when it came to the Holy Quran and the beginning of the revelation, the Prophet of Islam was about, four, of course, 40 years of age. Sayyida Khadija passed away when the Prophet of Islam was about 51 years of age. Therefore, 11 years of the revelation of the Quran was a possibility in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have revealed certain verses in order to somehow speak about some of the aspects that Sayyida Khadija would have to adhere to or some of the commands that she has to follow. The very fact that Allah Taala did not do so and only revealed verses with regards to other wives shows the status of Sayyida Khadija and how she was noble, how trustworthy and honorable she was when it comes to her relationship with the Holy Prophet. And the idea that the other verses that we have just come across were revealed not to praise the wives of the Prophet but rather to instruct them on important considerations that they must indeed take into action throughout their lives. This brings forth a very important subject that it requires us to somehow discuss, albeit fairly shortly. And that is the dynamics of the relationship that the Prophet of Islam had with his beloved wife Sayyida Khadija. Meaning, when we analyze the relationship that the Holy Prophet had with his uh, other wives and we come to compare it with uh, the way he displayed his uh, affinity with his only wife based on love. In other words, the marriage that Sayyida Khadija had with the Holy Prophet arguably is the only one that was founded on true love 
between the Holy Prophet and herself, yes? When we examine that relationship, what do we find? We find it stands out and it's unique from the other marriages that the Prophet of Islam had that, of course, happened in the city of Medina after migration. And it is important for us to reflect upon some key features that were present within the beautiful marriage of the Holy Prophet and this honorable lady. Why? The religion of Islam is not a theoretical religion. It's not a set of teachings that informs its followers you must do A, B, C, D, otherwise you'll be punished in a particular way. No. The religion is founded on practical applications and role models. Individuals whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have commanded you to live your life in a particular way. However, I will set forth examples of individuals who have come before and have demonstrated these values and principles in their lives that you should take as examplers and indeed learn from them. And hence, in order to become a Muslim, it's not sufficient to say La ilaha illallah, but at the same time to say what? Muhammadun Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. One is theory, the other is practice. Yes? The notion, therefore, that is presented is what was the dynamics and the particular features of the relationship or the marital life of the Holy Prophet and this honorable lady Khadija? When it comes to the Holy Quran, there are clear instructions as far as the other wives of the Prophet are concerned. But what were the things that indeed made this particular marriage one that is an exemplar for us to look at? Why is this topic important? No doubt, we have heard much about the subject of marriage in our lives and family relations. Today, the whole institution of marriage and family is under scrutiny. There are many out there who are subjecting it to all kinds of criticism. The idea that, for example, Time magazine in the United States published a survey that it conducted a few years ago asking people about the future of marriage. 40% of the respondents who were chosen at random within the United States said that we believe marriage will become obsolete and extinct in the future. They said there's no need for marriage. Why, why should people get married? Yes. It also ran a, a peace article which discussed the, mo the things that people would like to do or the things that people would wish that they do in order to attain happiness. The number one thing was to live by themselves, alone, not necessarily with a particular person under a relationship such as marriage. Indeed, at the same time, what do we find? We find many people, some of our youngsters, some other youth, they're delaying marriage to later on in life because of what they're hearing, because of the problems that they, encounter, uh, that they feel are being experienced by certain individuals, the negativity sometimes associated with marriage, the fear of failure when it comes to this particular relationship between the husband and the wife. The notion that even the definition of a family is now being subjected to different interpretations. It's no longer a woman and a man. And now there are many other interpretations or ways in which people say this is also a family unit. Yes. Therefore, what do we find? We find that this world of marriage is becoming a fascinated one. And one that requires us to constantly remind ourselves of the Islamic principles, but clearly link them to role models, individuals who live their lives in the most beautiful of ways. And indeed, do not be necessarily put off by the negativity out there. That's why I remember somebody used to say that, you know, it's very important to marry the right person. And therefore, if a man marries the right first person, they are complete. If they marry the wrong person, they are finished. But if the right person finds them with the wrong person, they are completely finished. Yes? The idea is that many times people have these fears. One of the mu'mineen once said that, you know, the problems and it comes to between husband and wife have caused much issues in the house. So he said, I was asked once by my local jamaat, by my local mosque, to give a presentation, to give a small short talk about marriage, about the rights of the husband and the wife. He said, I went home. Before going to speak, I spoke to my wife. I said to her, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to give a small speech about this issue, marriage in Islam. What shall I do you think I should speak about? 
His wife said to him, I believe you should speak about how many a times in marital relationships the husbands oppress the women, their wives. You should emphasize this. He said, on the contrary, I think I'm going to say the opposite. I'm going to describe how men are oppressed by women. Yes, This caused them to fight. This caused them to have an argument with each other. This man leaves angry. He comes to the mosque. He stands before the community. He starts speaking and uh, de uh, delivering what he believes is the right thing. And that is to prove from his own analysis that men are the ones who are being oppressed. When he finishes his short talk, he looks at the men who are sitting. He says, if you believe and you agree with what I have said, you must stand up in support of me. Stand up. Yes. I remember once I said this in a majlis, one person actually stood up. Yes. <laughs> Therefore, what happens is that uh, he said, you must stand up. Everybody stood up except one person who's sitting in the corner of the room. So this person said, Alhamdulillah, I am happy with this. At least the majority of the men agree with me with this regard. Except one person. That one person in the corner lifted his hand and said, Brother, I swear by Allah, I agree with you. But I can't stand up because I had a fight with my wife and my leg is broken. Yes. The idea is what? The idea is sometimes these kind of issues are presented and challenges in regards to the marital life that requires analysis and one of the best ways to present them is indeed to seek inspiration for those who have had a truly successful marital relationship yes despite the hardship despite the difficulties by right? there all the obstacles they've emerged successful in this particular regard let's have a look at this very briefly the relationship of the holy prophet and sayyida khadija in their marriage and what kind of lessons can be drawn? Five C's, I will call it. Yes, five C's so that the youngsters, the youth and others can remember these five C's. By the way, sometimes some of our mu'mineen, alhamdulillah, been married 40, 50 years, very happily. They come sit here, they say, you know what, I'm not going to benefit. No, these kind of discussions are helpful for everyone. Why? Number one, there is always scope for improvement of our relationship. Number two, we could be individuals who may be dealing with others when it comes to help or helping our own uh, children, for example, in establishing a fruitful, strong, cohesive, powerful relationship between the husband and wife. Therefore, it is one that is applicable to all when it comes to this area. The first C in the relationship of the Holy Prophet and uh, this honorable lady Khadija that I would like to look at is compassion. This is of the utmost importance because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, he could have said a number of things as far as marriage is concerned. But when he describes the process of marriage, he says, I will instill love and compassion between the husband and wife. If they're both understanding of their duties and responsibilities and want it to work, yes? وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً It is not a coincidence that Allah Taala selects the important quality of love and compassion between the husband and wife. Many times we have heard about the necessary necessity of that existing between the husband and wife. 1400 years ago, the Prophet of Islam would come forward and say, when a husband says to his wife, I love you, it never leaves her heart. Yes? Before all these self-help books and websites were created, the Prophet of Islam taught people that it's of the utmost importance to express love. Yes? Because uh, sometimes we might look at this and misunderstand it also. Remember, one of the scholars said, I was dealing with a couple, they were having problems. I asked the husband, do you express your love to your, your wife? He said, yes. I said, how? He said, you know, 20 years ago, I said to her, I love you. He said, why 20 years ago? He said, the Prophet said, once you say it once, it stays. Why should I say it anymore? No, this, the Prophet of Islam is saying, you should say it, doesn't mean you should not repeat it and reinforce it. No doubt, you should definitely make sure that it is demonstrated in many shapes and forms. Today, when it comes to this idea of love, how do we demonstrate it in marital relationships? I could very well sit here, and I know very well, many other ulama and speakers have sat on, the, uh, alhamdulillah, these members and I've said to you, we must express love, you must show love in marriage and so on. This is very well and is excellent and is needed. However, we need practical ways in which we show love. And in that, there is no harm in looking at modern day theories and advice given by, for example, psychologists, behavioral experts, sociologists and others who've come forward and studied the makeup of the human being, both males and females, and have 
suggested a number of key elements with regards to expressing love. How should mankind or human beings express love between each other or the husband and the wife? One model that has been presented is by an individual by the name of Gary Chapman. And he has authored a book. The book is called The Languages of Love. Yes? No problem discussing these from the member. Yes? It is not only about, for example, saying this and that from Islamic traditions. Sometimes we need to look at what's been going on out there and seek the best. Yes? Whatever you hear, you take the best from it. This individual is written this book, very important book. I recommend that, for example, you either get a, a copy of it or you review it on these particular sites. There are some summaries of this book. What is it referring to? This individual says, as far as human behavior and expression of love is concerned, it's like a language. Yes? It's like a language. So, for example, if, for example, I come now to speak to someone here in Nairobi, someone in the streets who doesn't know English at all. Yes? I start to speak with them, but I don't know Kiswahili. I don't know how to speak it. I wish I knew, but I don't. When I speak to that individual, he doesn't understand me. Yes? I could claim to the people, look, I'm trying to communicate with this person, but he's being rude. He's not responding to me. Yes? I'm trying to show some kind of respect. I am communicating, speaking with him. Yes? But he is not necessarily communicating back or that I am not understanding. The response will be, it's because you are not using his language. Yes, you are trying to communicate, but you must use his language. Similarly, love has languages. It is not one thing. Like we have so many languages that we utter and speak, love has different languages. So he says love and expression of love and receiving love has five languages. And he says it's important the husband and the wife know what is the language of the other. Therefore, how would they know? They conduct these surveys or these questionnaires each other and then they have a score they score at the end and then they may come to the conclusion that one of the five languages is their love language they call it how they love like to receive the love and how they would for example like to give love let's go through these five very quickly it becomes a bit clearer when we explain them in case people or mu'mineen have not come through them he says the first uh, one is called words of affirmation yes Kind words, beautiful words, expression of love through the tongue, yes? The idea is that some people love this more than any other, yes? They crave this much more than other. It is essentially positive, uplifting comments. Comments that places joy and happiness to the heart. It could also be through, for example, poems or letters, between the husband and wife, yes? That could also be something beneficial and useful. On the contrary, if somebody's love language is words of affirmation, insults and vulgar words hurt them more. Yes? Because they crave that words which are what? Which are gentle and kind and nice. Yes? But if they don't get it and instead they get, for example, obscene words, it hurts them even more. Yes? That's the first thing. Yes. The second love language is known as acts of service. What is acts of service? It's anything that involves doing something that the other person loves. For example, it may be certain tasks, preparing a meal, washing the dishes, yes, helping out with the homework of the children. Whatever it is, it is an act of service that it is an, a language that, of love that sometimes a person indeed desires. So what it, this means is that they may not necessarily want the words, they may want the action. Yes, because sometimes what do we find when we deal with marital conflicts between husband and wife? The husband says, you know, I took my wife to the most expensive holiday vacation in Dubai. Yes, but still look at her. She does not respect me. And the wife says, I don't feel loved. Yes, I don't feel loved. Why? Because he is offering a different language than what she actually wants. She doesn't necessarily want that act of that service or gift, for example, because the third language of love is gifts 
yes expressing expression of love through presence yes for example during anniversaries for example during birthdays yes uh, and sometimes it could be unexpected it's a lovely gesture just to present a gift to each other in an unexpected way just as a demonstration of love the holy prophet of islam rasulullah muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam famously says tahadu tahabu yes if you give uh, gifts between each other this will increase the love between you yes and gifts are of the most important thing sometimes for some people they really value i remember reading that that one day a person forgot the anniversary of his marriage with his wife you know you don't want to do that normally under normal circumstances this person forgot it at night his wife said to him you do remember that tomorrow is our anniversary he said oh yes 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 she said you do know that i am expecting a gift from you he said very well what are you expecting she said i want to see outside the house something that goes from zero to a hundred in 10 seconds yes that is what i'm expecting now this person thought, what am I going to do? Next morning, she opens the door of the house. She finds in front of her what? A set of bathroom scale, you know? <laughs> the idea is what? Sometimes we forget. And it's important that these are not uh, uh, taken for granted. This issue, especially if the language of love is gift. The Holy Prophet of Islam loved Sayyidah Khadija so much that he would give gifts to the friends of Khadija. Yes. Later, narrations tell us that in Medina, anybody who would come who was a friend of Khadija or was beloved to Khadija, the Prophet of Islam would give gifts to that particular individual. That was the extensive love that existed between the Holy Prophet and this honorable lady. The fourth language of love that is described is known as quality time. That means what? That means time that is dedicated, devoted to each other without any distractions. Time that people that one spends with the other, yes, and not time arguing or bickering or fighting, but no quality times means focusing on each other, making each other happy. The idea of, for example, going out together or, for example, having a, a peaceful conversation together, yes, this is of the utmost importance. Lack of listening, according to this author, when you don't listen to each other, is the contrary. Uh, demonstration towards what this language of love so when people uh, refuse to listen to their wives or when their wives if you refuse to listen to their husbands and if the language of love is quality time that impacts tremendously negatively yes because sometimes we find some of our brothers yes when it comes we have to criticize both otherwise I'm in trouble I have to be fair yes sometimes our brothers are sitting they're watching TV uh, the wife comes and says you know I want to talk to you about something yes 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 go ahead go ahead well you know we had the problem today this ah look at this what's happening on the you know in the news I said so your focus is what not completely towards this particular conversation or this engagement uh, that one has to have with regards to uh, uh, the each other the holy prophet of islam would come forward and say he or she who spends time quality time with the other yes in a marital relationship gets more reward from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than performing i'tikaf in my masjid he says I'tikaf in Masjid al-Nabawi is one of the greatest things to do, yes? I'tikaf itself is to fast, to do ibadah only in the Masjid, as you know. But the Prophet of Islam says, when you spend time with your wife, or the wife spends time with the husband, that is what even more reward than this noble act. And the fifth quality, uh, language of love is physical touch. For some people, this is of their most importance, and therefore negligence in this results in disastrous consequences. You find that when you look at this subject, yes, when a husband and wife recognizes that each other's, and that doesn't mean that one uh, individual have only one language of love they may have some of the others but certainly one comes out and is more dominant than the other
Yes, and that is why there is a need, and this is one model that is presented to enhance the relationship between the husband and the wife. When you look at uh, this uh, honorable relationship between Sayyida Khadija and the Holy Prophet of Islam, you recognize what? You recognize that the Prophet of Islam loved Khadija to the extent that when somebody mentioned the name of Khadija, he would weep and cry, yes. And he would say, no, there was no wife that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me like whom? Like like Khadija and the love that Khadija had for the Prophet that she would give everything for the sake of the Prophet and for the sake of the religion of Islam that surely demonstrates the strong bond that they had with each other so the first C therefore is compassion the second C from the relationship of Sayyida Khadija and the Holy Prophet is known as connection what does this mean this refers to the idea of understanding the ethos and the background behind the purpose of marriage within the religion of Islam. In the idea that it is not simply to get two people together, in the idea that it's not simply to fulfill physical pleasures, but rather to enhance the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to make the journey of this life something smoother and quicker to attain paradise. This is a very important point. Why? When you look at successful marriages out there, of course, when you look at the, this honorable marriage, and you look at, of course, the marriage of Amir al Mu'mineen as well as Sayyidatul Nisa, Fatima al Zahra, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhima. You find that this was a very important quality that emerged from their relationship. Everything was done for the sake of Allah or to enhance the relationship with Allah or to connect more with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. In which way is this necessarily important? We are told and encouraged that as husband and wife, we have to repeat, uh, constantly repeat amongst ourselves and remind ourselves that the objective is to get to Jannah. And how beautiful it is that we complement each other's journey towards paradise not necessarily be the obstacle to get to paradise what do we mean sometimes husband and wife treat each other as adversaries as enemies rather than as friends or partners in an objective you know when you have a business partnership of course both partners of those two they seek to ensure that the profit is maximum not that one wants the profit to be less than the other yes no they both work hard to ensure that the yield is much much more we are told at a very important quality is to constantly say between ourselves as husband and wife is this pleasing God or not is this something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to happen or not? Yes. And to have this as the barometer as far as the relationship is concerned. Yes, there will be problems. There will still be sometimes people who may not necessarily focus. But in, in essentially, we need to bring back this attention to this idea. And to have an objective to get to Jannah together. That is a very important, and that is something, for example, from the beginning of marriage, for those who are not married, to think about, to have that pledge between each other. I'm going to help you, and you're going to help me to get to Jannah together. Yes? Once one of the ulama, a very famous uh, scholar, uh, he sat on the member and he spoke about this and said, let us work together as husband and wife so that Jannah is attained together. Yes? He says, all of a sudden, one elderly individual was sitting in the crowd, walked out stood up and walked out normally this indicates that they're unhappy with what's being said normally it means that they're not pleased yes he says when i finished the majlis he was still around outside i went to him i said brother did i say something wrong you are visibly not happy why did you walk out of the majlis he looked at me and said sheikh i can't believe you said this he said why he said, oh, I am 55 years of age. For the last 20 years, I've been trying to get rid of my wife. You want her to come to Jannah with me? <laughs> now, why is this individual thinking that way? They haven't understood the connection to God that marriage can indeed establish. How many times we've heard in nikah ceremonies, yes? This whole idea is constantly repeated every nikah ceremony. But do we really think about it? Marriage is a process that is not only physical fulfillment, it is more importantly for spiritual upliftment. Yes, that spirituality in marriage is often not indeed uh, applied or looked at. 
uh, extensively when it comes to setups and when it comes to examples that are presented. Let me give you just a very brief philosophical uh, discussion in this regard because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran often when he describes marriage he describes and uses the word nafs yes uh, Allah tabarak ta'ala ta says wa min ayati an khalaq lakum min anfusikum azwajan yes often there is a correlation between nafs and zawaj and marriage ulama and especially the philosophers have come and said there is a reason behind that and that is, when you put two things together often, they are either physical combination or a real combination, they say. For example, if I take this cup of water and I place it here next to this particular member, it's a physical combination. One is touching each other, but it is not producing anything. It is not yielding anything out of a, as a result. It's not producing any fruits, yes? They say, however, a real combination is when, for example, you bring hydrogen and oxygen molecules, you produce what? Water. Yes, that's a real combination. Yes, they say Allah wa Taala has intentionally placed this emphasis on the nafs because they say when two nafs come together in marriage, it is not for a physical combination; it's for a real combination to produce jannah, to bring about paradise. It's a real combination that produces the obedience of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you find that the Prophet of Islam found the greatest comfort as far as his wife is concerned to be Sayyida Khadija, who recognized the whole objective, who did not say, you know what, you know, I, I, I know uh, that uh, you have this uh, responsibility of delivering, but don't get me involved in it, yes. I'm not necessarily going to be, because you might, you might sit here and think, of course she was going to do that. Of course, Khadija, number one, she's not ma'soom. So we don't have necessarily this idea that she will do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala messenger wants her to do. Yes, number two, we have other examples of the other wives of the Prophet who did not do that. Later in Medina, did all the wives of the Prophet come to him and say, you know what, we're going to support you and do everything that you do and not stand against you and whatever it takes. Of course not. So we have examples of otherwise it not do. Yes, what Khadija al Kubra, Salamullah alayha did. Khadija said to the Prophet, Everything that I have is at your disposal. And she recognized the overall picture and the objective. Yes, so the second C is indeed connection. The third C of the utmost importance is what? Is commitment. Meaning, when the going gets tough, Sometimes people question their affinity and their loyalty with each other. That sometimes the husband loses the job or sometimes the wife goes through illness. Yes. That commitment is essential. That commitment is needed. That demonstration that the bond will not break just because sometimes people go through hardships. Sometimes people go through difficulties. Yes. The Prophet of Islam went through all this hardship and later for three years in the Shu'ab of Abu Talib. Khadija did not walk out of the relationship. She did not say, you know, I am Amira to Quraysh. I am not somebody who, you know, can withstand this. You know, we are told when they were there in that area, barricaded and under sanctions, they used to eat uh, leaves from the trees. That was their food. Khadija, who is one of the wealthiest women in Arabia, would ha be having this kind of food. It's easy to say, but in practice, it demonstrated her loyalty. It demonstrated what? Her commitment. That's the third C. The fourth C is what? And that's why the Quran, by the way, says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبَرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Yes, work together when it comes to what? Righteousness and God consciousness. The fourth C is what? Is cooperation. Cooperation means what? It means that we understand the family unit is one where both the husband and wife have roles to supplement and support each other and not necessarily to be agents of difficulty for each other. In the notion that the religion of Islam encourages that the husband and wife, for example, take part in noble services to the community, in the upbringing of their children, that they have plan already drawn up on how they will ensure that their children are what are taught in the best possible way and educated in the best possible way. For example, to establish salah at home, salatul jama'a, if they're not able to come to mosque, yes? For example, to recite Quran together at home. This ta'awan, this cooperation, this help of the other is of the utmost importance, yes? 
You see that the Prophet of Islam, Layda Khadija, was what? A successful businesswoman, yes? But when it came to the marriage, what happened? She stopped her business. Why did she stop her business? Why did she not continue? Because she recognized the Prophet of Islam, what was under scrutiny at that time. The Prophet of Islam, especially after receiving the revelation, yes? She would be serving him. She would want to be supporting him. She would want to be standing with him. They were working as a team together. Yes, when it comes to, for example, Salah, it would be her, the Prophet of Islam, Amir al Mu'mineen, and later on, Zayd ibn Hartha would pray as a unit in Masjid al Haram whilst being subjected to all kinds of different abuse. Yes, cooperation is of the utmost importance, and we see the fruits of this wonderful relationship emerging in an even more emphatic relationship and that is of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Sayyida Fatima yes in the idea that the Prophet of Islam would come to the house of these honorable individuals he find Amir al-Mu'mineen sieving the pulses or sweeping the floor yes and he would see him helping in the household chores yes and the Prophet of Islam would say and would indeed recommend that the Mu'mineen would help out their wives in this particular task, yes, it is not to say it is not my responsibility. It is not something that I do. Yes. The Prophet of Islam would say, he who helps, this is found in book Makarimul Akhlaq, this narration. The Prophet of Islam would say, according to the narration, he who, who helps his wife in the household chores, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them palaces in Jannah in return. The idea that emerges is what? It increases the bond. It increases the love and that special relationship that should indeed exist. And the fifth C that we find that was prevalent in the relationship of the Holy Prophet and this honorable lady is known as calmness. Yes? Or otherwise patience. Yes. In the notion that in the turbulent life that some people will go through, there's a need to exercise sabr and steadfastness. There's a need to calm each other and to recognize also that one of the two may go through a hard time in their lives. If they're going through a hard difficulty in their life or within a particular month, for example, they've lost their jobs or they've lost a loved one, it is the moment for the other to support them, to withstand if the other is angry, yes? To withstand if the other is not necessarily their normal self. Having said that, one of the most devastating and uh, prevalent causes for divorce and breakdowns in relationship in our communities is anger. Yes, people are not able to channel their anger properly. Yes. And it certainly happens between husband and wife as far as the husband's responsibility, but even that sometimes the wife's responsibility. I mentioned a few nights ago with a few mu'mineen that a few years ago I spoke about the dangers and the re devastating repercussions of physical domestic abuse especially when the husband beats the wife or hits the wife, yes? And we have narrations that clearly prohibit this, yes? When I posted this on Facebook, what responses I got? Many of the people, men, is their narrations that stop women from beating their husbands. You might be thinking this is unusual, but today the challenges are now something which we are encountering, perhaps that we have not necessarily encountered in the past. Therefore, anger management is not necessarily something which is bad. Some people say, no, I don't want to admit. Yes, well, you clearly have an anger problem. Yes, if we and I are not able to diagnose and not willing for others to diagnose our problems, yes, we will not progress. And therefore, sometimes we do need assistance. Sometimes we need counseling. We need help in the way we deal with situations that may make us angry, yes? That may make us say things that we're not necessarily supposed to say. Therefore, the prerequisites is what? Is to be patient and to be understanding and to be loving in this particular way. And you find that the Prophet of Islam, when it came to Khadija, salamullahi alayha, we do not find any, any narration. And trust me, there were enemies of Islam and Ahl al-Bayt who are searching and searching and wanted to somehow find any problems in this relationship. Why? Because the daughter of Khadija is Fatima. Just like how they sought to distort the reputation of Abu Talib because the son of Abu Talib is Ali. They wanted to find any problems in the marriage of Sayyidah Khadija and the Prophet because of what? Their daughter is Fatima, such is the hatred. But they could not find. Such was the respect, such was the patience, such was the bond, such was the love. 
If there was any issues, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal a verse. Yes? It would not hold back. Allah wa ta'ala would have commanded at that time. Yes? He would have said that, for example, do this, don't do this. But the very fact that this honorable lady was an exemplar as far as a wife who is what? Who has understanding of her responsibilities and duties. And the Prophet of Islam being the greatest example of a husband who is noble, who had all the virtuous characteristics, should exist for day, today as, as a example for all of us to emulate and to indeed follow. The Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab comes forward in final verse that discusses this idea of the marriages of the Holy Prophet and instructions to the wife says that you are in a very special place you are in the houses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals his verses yes reveals the ayat but what's the difference between ayatullah wal hikmah wisdom yes some of the mufassirin have said hikmah is uh, indeed some of the verses of the Quran that are applicable to the lives of these, uh, these ladies, these wives of the Prophet. Yes. Others have said, no, this is a hikmah means the narrations of the Holy Prophet. Yes, what he says. In other words, his instructions, whatever is said to you, in addition to ayatullah, Yes, whatever is uh, given to you out of the wisdom of the Holy Prophet from his teachings, from his traditions, you have to maximize the opportunity from it. You have to take from it as much as you can. You are being gifted. You are in a special position here. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind and considerate and he is aware of what to give you. Here, there's a practical lesson that we will end with, inshallah ta'ala. And that is what? That is, you and I, alhamdulillah ta'ala, have been blessed with the opportunity to attend and to listen to majalis. Have been opportunity to, uh, for example, take part in programs that enhances our understanding of the religion of Islam. Yes. Similarly, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the wives of the Prophet, I have given you this out of my kindness and generosity, out of my blessings that you are in households that the Quran is revealed therefore maximize take from it as much as possible yes similarly for us too we mustn't be individuals who attend majalis for year and year and we are not seeing any progress in ourselves we are not seeing necessarily development as far as our knowledge is concerned as far as our spirituality is concerned as far as our akhlaq is concerned year after year every ramadan muharram after muharram arba'een after arba'een every season after every season we must be able to identify some form of progression some form of development within ourselves as well as our family members it is of the utmost importance in this regard that's number one number two we should also be individuals who encourage others to take part and to attend and to seek the blessing you know there is a issue today that alhamdulillah some centers around the world they have and others they do not and perhaps i'm not seeing it addressed very much but i personally have a concern about it and that is live web broadcasting yes live web broadcasting is helping some of them who are elderly they have children to sit at home and to watch very well it's okay yes at least it's serving a purpose but what it's also doing it's making some people lazy I won't attend the majlis, I'll just listen to it next day, or you know, I'll watch it. And how they'll watch it? In Muharram, they'll sit in their sofa on the front of the TVs with their popcorn, mashallah. Yes? As if they are watching a movie. Yes? This is a problem because the Ahl al Bayt would come forward and say, Khud al ilma min afwah al ulama. When you come to take knowledge, take it from the mouths of the speakers or the scholars, meaning attendance itself is not only powerful as far as gaining the knowledge directly, but also it's a demonstration of what? Of support towards the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't it? The notion that is presented is we must ensure that the message reaches, especially for our youngsters, because they're starting to become lazy about attending mosque. They're starting to say, Why should I? You know, if it means learning, there are mashallah so many majalis out there. Whereas we are told it has social dimension, it has a spiritual dimension, it has an educational dimension. In many ways, it is what the Ahl al-Bayt have said about reviving the affairs. Ahyu amrana rahimallahu man 
Ahya Amrana. Finally, the spiritual tip for this evening. The next verse, as we mentioned before in the Holy Quran, finally says, وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا uh, After describing ten qualities of the mu'mineen and mu'minat, yes, Allah Taala, the tenth quality says, it's the ones who remember Allah abundantly and uses kathira to explain that they must do it on a regular basis. One act of a great importance is the tasbih of Sayyidat al-Nisa, Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. And we have seen, the narration says, one of the manifestations of dhikrullahi kathira is tasbih Fatima. Yes? To say 34 times Allahu Akbar, 33 times Alhamdulillah, 33 times Subhanallah, after each salah, but, or after each salah, fard or mustahab, and after salatul layl, but also before going to sleep. It is highly recommended to do so. That's why our narration says, you know, Islam doesn't leave any dimension. Yes, marital relationships, there's teachings. Yes, food, there's teaching. Eat, uh, drinking, there is teachings and etiquettes and adab. There is adab for going to sleep. Yes, one of the adab of falling asleep is to recite tasbihah of Sayyida Fatima. Yes, as well as being in the state of wudu. Yes, as well as being in the state of purity. Narration say, he or she who is in the state of wudu goes to sleep in that state their bed turns into a masjid in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being worshipped. Yes. Such is the recommendation to do so. And if they die in their sleep in the state of wudu, according to the narration, they die a shaheed, martyr. Yes. It doesn't take much, you know, a minute or two sometimes. We have very quick wudu out there. Just a practice to be done just before we go to sleep. And importantly, the tasbih of Sayyida Fatima does wonders. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our marriages and strengthen them within the teachings of the religion of Islam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq to be able to serve him all the time. We pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our a'mal and our fast during the month of Ramadan. We pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam and to make us of his devout and sincere followers. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahumma wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.